thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I, um, I have to admit I'm a little nervous. I do a lot of presenting to uh, the general public, but this is the first time I've spoken to a large group of physicians about uh, what I usually call hormones and stress. Um, I wouldn't never dare to actually advertise myself talking about a topic called adrenal fatigue uh, for fear that the college would come and investigate me. So uh, the irony isn't lost on me that I was specifically asked to speak about what is adrenal fatigue and, and how we can all help to manage it. Um, so what, what I would really like to do is, um, is to help us all understand what, uh, what we can do when patients come in and ask us around adrenal fatigue or they bring in you know, stacks of literature about what they found out and, and, uh, and this is what they have. And so to create a plan and to help us have a language to help explain to the patients and to help better understand their questions. Um, my, my focus here then is to really be clinically useful and also to really look at some of the places where our current medical paradigm falls down. So one of the, the issues um, and that I find in our overall medical system, and I'm not here as a political stand, but is that we're very disease-based training. We're very, very good at trauma and at significant disease and anything that requires really big guns. You know, we've got good drugs, we've got amazing surgery, we've got some amazing tools that we have. And where we, we don't do as well is anything that's kind of chronic. And, uh, and we're struggling with that. And often we'll end up using our big guns in order to manage chronic diseases that could have been managed much better with lifestyle changes and with really simple interventions. So, so adrenal fatigue is a, a name of a book as well as a name of a syndrome um, that was, sorry, I lost my train of thought there for a minute. It was a, a syndrome that was named in 1998 by Dr. James Wilson, and he was the one who actually coined the phrase adrenal fatigue. And he, he based it upon looking at these patients who were coming to him with a very distinctive pattern of tiredness, and we'll get into what some of those symptoms were as we move along. Um, but it became very appealing for people, just the same as the fibromyalgia became appealing for people, because they were able to say, oh, now I know why I'm so tired in the morning and why, you know, if I stay up after late at night, I catch a second wind and why I, want, why I crave salt and why I crave sugar and why my lymph nodes in my neck are always up. You know, they, uh, why, how come I have sore throats? How come I get recurrent infections? Because a lot of these people were seeing their family physicians who would say, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. Um, and there isn't anything wrong with them from a disease place, and yet these people feel really, really unwell. And so he coined this phrase so that people would have something to hold on to. And from my perspective, the, the problem with it is, is that he just gave people another label to hold on to rather than looking at the whole um, spectrum of adrenal burnout, adrenal dysfunction as, as, as a range of problems. The approach that I really like is one that involves, uh, is, is fairly highly um, promoted through the functional medicine people. And uh, there's a book called Revive, Stop Feeling Spent and Start Living Again. So if your patients have come to you with this book, Adrenal Fatigue, you can say, well, you know, there's a lot of good information in there because there's very good information. But as an approach to how to get better, this is a much better place to begin. And uh, what it really does is it takes away the stigma of calling this a, a, a condition, calling it a disease, and it really puts us back into looking at what are the, how do we manage our lifestyle, how do we manage our lives so that we actually create a place of wellness. And as we get more and more well, all those symptoms of illness start to fall away. Does that make sense when, when I say that? Is there sort of a, an understanding about the difference about if you pursue wellness, then you don't become then you're no longer ill. But if you focus on being ill, then we're always looking for solutions to fix the illness. And so my approach is really one of looking at, well, these are the basic things you really, really need to do in order to get well. And as you get well, then those other things just go away. I think that's a very important part. Alternate labels and associated disorders that you find with the uh, adrenal fatigue thing are obvious adrenal burnout, uh, CFS, fibromyalgia, multiple chemical sensitivities, adrenal exhaustion, anxiety and depression, um, often non-Addison's hypoadrenia, subclinical hypoadrenalinism, neurasthenia, burnout. I often refer in the end to everything as burnout. Um, for a while when I first got into this work about four, four years ago, I, um, I used the term adrenal fatigue a lot more liberally. And um, I was actually quite amazed at the thought that 
that here was something I'd never learned about in medicine, not, not in a really true way, that could help me explain all these symptoms that my patients were having. Um, now I find that burnout actually best describes it and keeps people in a place where they're not getting attached to the diagnosis. Because really, when it comes down to it, what we're talking about is stress and stress and how our bodies handle it. So I, I kind of like this slide because most of the patients I see in my office who are coming in, they actually tend not to be people who are, you know, sort of unhappy or having hard lives or even if they are those kind of people, what they've done is they've been working really hard to overcompensate. So a lot of the people I see are, are very, very driven, very accomplished, a lot of people who have done extremely well in their lives, um, a lot of people who have changed careers, a lot of people who have had amazing obstacles, either childhood problems or familial problems or uh, relationship issues that they overcome one after another. And to be honest, that's probably the, story, the true story for almost anybody's life. But these tend to be people who are fighters. Um, and, but they often look a lot like this guy, although a lot of them are actually women. So if we, if we think about um, adrenal fatigue and we put that label aside for a moment and really think about what we're really dealing with is an issue of stress and how do we help our patients better manage their physical responses to stress. Um, it becomes really important when we notice that two-thirds of patients presenting to primary care have a stress-related condition and more than 50% of individuals with any condition can trace its origins back to stress. 40% of U.S. workers describe selves as stressed or very stressed. And I think in this day and age, it's almost impossible to be living in the Western world or possibly any part of the world and to not be feeling stress. One of the big things I never really learned in, in medical school was the idea of biochemical individuality. And nowadays we use a lot of terms like patient-centered care and a lot of um, uh, words that have to talk about, well, everybody's a little bit different. But I, I, uh, Dr. Roger Wilson, around 40 years ago, came up with this idea of biochemical individuality. He was a, a chemist who um, did a lot of work on human nutrition. And what he discovered was that uh, as you changed, gave people, people had different requirements for different kinds of nutrients. So particularly alcoholics, he actually did a lot of work with alcoholics and found that just by changing their, their dietary, their supplements and things like that, he could actually reduce their alcoholism and their craving for alcohol. And they could often have a, a social drink and not continue drinking or become an alcoholic any further. One of the things that, uh, one of the expressions that I really like is this genes load the gun and the environment pulls the trigger. A lot of my patients come to me sort of saying, well, you know, it's in my genes. I'm, you know, I'm overweight because it's in my genes. You know, I have PCOS because my mother did and my sister does, you know, or I have high blood pressure because everybody in my family has it. And there's a, there's a tendency for um, us in the past to have sort of said, well, you have this genetic inheritance and this is going to be your destiny. This is like the blueprint for the rest of your life. And one of the beautiful things that's come out of all the, the understanding of the genes and the, the genetic, um, un unraveling the genetic, co genetic code, is really starting to recognize that it's not really the genes themselves, but it's the expression of the genes that makes the biggest difference. And uh, there's a whole field of, of epigenetics that's evolving and sort of recognizing that even within our lifetimes, we can alter the expression of our gene code in such a way that it, that can be inherited. The expression can be inherited by our, by our progeny and it, it isn't necessarily a change in the gene code itself. And so as we start recognizing that there are many different things that affect how, that, that alter how we express our genes, we start recognizing the importance of the environment. So yes, we're born with a certain blueprint, we're born with a certain set of, 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 um, of, of guidelines, but how that gets expressed is really up to how we live. And some of those uh, things are controllable and some of them aren't. So Hans Selye, the great grandfather of stress and stress research, is just basically calls stress is the mismatch between perceived demands and our ability to meet them. And so once again, we get back to the biochemical individuality. So I might be able to get through medical school and you know, have, a, have a family and you know, go to conferences and do things. And you know, at a certain point, I hit a, I hit a point that's too much for me. Meanwhile, there's somebody else who you know, barely makes it out of high school and they're burnt out and you know, they're having a lot of problems. Somebody else um, you know, can do infinitely more than I can on a whole lot of less sleep, as far as I can see. And what we tend to do sometimes is compare ourselves to other people. And I think as human beings, it's very hard not to compare yourself to other people. And when we start recognizing is what we want to do is optimize how we work within our own ability, in our own framework, it makes a big difference. 
So I, I've spent a couple of slides just looking at what are the stressors. And one of the main reasons for that is, is coming back to this idea of biochem biochemical individuality. Something that's a stressor for one person may not be for another. So the, the broad category of life situations is the one that most people consider a stressor. You know, things like your work or your age, your gender, you know, what's happening in the relationships, did somebody die? Um, I particularly find things like emails and cell phones, which are, are one of the biggest stressors in my life. Um, preparing the slides for this conference was I, the ultimate chronic stress situation. Presenting acute stress, I can handle, but that chronic stress of trying to figure out how these slides go together was challenging for me. I'm switching from an app to an apple, and uh, whew, not, not fun. Um, I, even this morning, I was struggling with it because I wanted to change something. So, so the life situations are things, and often when I ask somebody, are you stressed, they'll say, you don't know, everything's fine. And yet you can look at them and just sitting beside them. You know how some people, you sit beside them and you can just feel the tension coming off of them. I had um, uh, one guy uh, in my office recently, and he's, uh, he's a, a, a trainer, he's a physiotherapist, and he's a trainer, and he's, I don't know, six foot two, and perfectly built, and the epitome of health. And, you know, but he was in, he was 32 years old, and, and he was having difficulty with erections. And um, he was saying, but there's no stress in my life. And I said, you know, I, I'm, not looking, I'm not looking around for what that stress is, but there's some kind of stress because there isn't a physiologic reason for what's happening with you. And finally he said, you know, well, you know, I'm hypervigilant. And I said, well, when we started looking at where he was hypervigilant and where things were happening and how that played negatively into his lifestyle, then we could understand, then he could actually see that he was stressed, even though he wasn't having a life situation stress. So thoughts and beliefs. Um, I, I find uh, I spend a fair bit of time with my patients on the very first visit and, uh, and I actually have them fill out a lengthy questionnaire which is one of the things that people who are working with adrenal fatigue are supposed to do. Um, but I find it very helpful because when I start looking at, sometimes people present really, really well but when I look into their past and I see where they've come from, um, often abusive childhoods, often um, uh, difficult relationships, often abandonment, a whole lot of things, and they've compensated, compensated, compensated all their lives. And one of the things that I do with that is I really help people draw the, draw the line from the present moment into the past to be able to see how their present moment is, or, or their present reactivity is a response to all those series of situations that have come up. So particularly things that, that lead to aggravate stress or the hypervigilance, the hypercritical, fearful, perfectionist, anxious. These are all actually good traits for becoming a physician. It helps us make sure we don't miss anything. Um, sleep is another thing. Uh, when I first started doing this work, um, I didn't focus as much on sleep. I, I mean, everybody I saw was tired and I didn't particularly think about that as a stressor. One of the things that we find, and as I move into the other slides and looking at cortisol levels, if you don't get enough sleep, you can't, eventually your cortisol levels will drop. If your cortisol levels are low, it's hard to, sli hard to sleep, and you end up in this cycle. Um, and so I, I spend a lot of time talking about sleep. Um, you know, nowadays we do a good job investigating for sleep apnea, and that's helping a, a lot of people. Um, one of the biggest problems I find in my, um, particularly in my middle-aged women, I, I was a little more surprised than I expected to be, is about how much alcohol is consumed, um, just sort of to relax. Um, and uh, I find that being quite specific about it and being quite non-judgmental, I, I find, you know, in excess of a half to often a whole bottle of wine is not uncommon for many women to consume in the evening. Um, and uh, it usually has crept up and they're not actually aware of what they're drinking and, or aware of how that interrupts, interferes with their sleep, let alone everything else. Um, and then one of the other big things around sleep, which I, have, I don't have another slide on it later, but it's just this whole idea of too much light. Um, we, we do best, mel melatonin uh, is best produced in the dark, so if you're sleeping in a, in a, with a night light and your clock radio going beside you and the windows open with the street light shining in, the quality of sleep you're going to get isn't going to be as good. Um, and then lifestyle, and uh, you know, particular sugar, caffeine, alcohol, processed and white foods. I had a, a patient in just the other day who uh, epitomized this. Um, it, it was quite interesting. Uh, she was um, probably about in her early, mid-40s and uh, significantly overweight, um, looked insulin resistant, insisted that she was not diabetic, um, you know, wasn't really willing to look at the fact that there was a spectrum of, of, of uh, again, a spectrum of dysfunction that leads up to her diabetes, uh, her becoming diabetic. 
And um, she had just lost 13 pounds because she'd gone sugar-free. Oh, and she'd cut down from a bottle and a half of wine tonight to about two glasses or three glasses. And, uh, but nobody, she'd seen, she'd seen specialists, she'd been to New York, she'd been to all sorts of places, and nobody had actually seemingly addressed her alcohol and her caffeine intake. And uh, I, I'm not quite sure how that happened, or maybe she just didn't hear it, which is also a possibility. Um, but we had a long talk about how, what a negative impact that has, and I'll explain why in a few minutes. So the sleep again, and then exercise. Um, the other thing I find in my overachieving patients, which you may find as well, is this uh, excessive exercise. Um, right now, we, everybody knows you're supposed to exercise. Uh, a lot of people I find think you need to exercise to exhaustion. And so I have somebody who's worked a 10-hour day, and then they, they go and they spend two hours on the treadmill and pushing weights and doing that, and they fall in bed exhausted, but they did their exercise. Um, and in somebody who's already fatigued, excessive exercise just adds more fatigue, uh, and let alone whether it's correctly performed or not. So when we're talking about stress, the major hormones that are involved are your adrenaline, your cortisol, and your insulin. And so these are basically your survival hormones. And uh, what I want to do is just uh, discuss a little bit the, the pathophysiology of, um, of the stress response. Uh, and I know we all have learned it in medical school. I want to expand upon it in the context of the adrenal fatigue that people experience. Because I think once we understand what's happening in the body, we can start understanding the symptoms people, patients are having. And so, as I said, I do a lot of my time, I spend a lot of my time explaining to patients what, how their symptoms fit into a normal physiologic response to stress. So once they understand that, you know, oh, well, my heart should be racing when I'm stressed, they start recognizing that, oh, okay, maybe there's something I can do about it. But a lot of people have a lot of adverse reactions to physiologic events and then the anxiety gets worse and worse. And, uh, and then they come in and we can't find anything wrong because there isn't anything wrong. Their body is appropriately responding to stress. It's just been going on for a long time and it's become debilitating. So adrenaline um, you know, and epinephrine, norepinephrine, they're made in the adrenal medulla. Um, cortisol and the gluco and the mineral cortic uh, corticoids are made in the adrenal cortex and insulin from the pancreas. Uh, again, when I first started doing this work uh, four years ago, I, I kind of didn't pay much attention to insulin. I found that when I started helping people, you know, support their bodies with, with uh, some of the supplements that I use and that we'll talk about, um, that, uh, you know, I didn't pay as much attention to the diet as I do now. Um, and what I found is that I should have been the other way around, is that often if I can actually help them clean up how they're eating and get them to understand why, it makes a big difference. Because basically we're still animals in our animal bodies. And uh, a lot of times people forget that. Uh, I, I always say we, we drive fancy cars, we wear fancy clothes, and we act as if, as if we're, uh, we're different, and yet we're not. Uh, there's a really great book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. And it's um, by a guy called Dr. Robert Zabchowski. And it's a wonderful book on talking about the uh, stress response. It's about 10 years old now, and so there's been a lot more information since that time. But uh, if, if you ever want to refer your patients to it or read it yourself, it's, it's excellent. One of the differences betwe between us and animals is um, I often use the example of, of this. This is, a, I think, a water buffalo, but I usually use a, a gazelle. If you are a gazelle and you are on the savanna in Africa and a lion jumps out and starts chasing you, well, you're going to immediately go into your fight or flight. You're into your survival mode. And so your heart rate's going to go up, blood pressure will go up, respiratory rate goes up, the blood leaves your digestive system because if you're going to survive, who cares whether you digested that last meal? So it leaves your digestive system, it goes to you know, the survival parts of your brain, it goes to your muscles, it doesn't care about uh, elimination except to get rid of anything that's there at the time, it doesn't matter, care about absorption of nutrients, it doesn't care about your immune system, all you want to do is survive. So you're full on adrenaline state. Now, as that gazelle, you have an advantage because you're just going to, uh, as, as the gazelle, you, you're just going to run as much as you can. Most of us, faced with our, our, our own types of stress situations, unfortunately, they aren't real tigers or lions jumping out at us. It's usually the alarm clock going off or traffic or the kids late for school or, you know, or being yelled at by your colleague or a patient. Or, um, so a gazelle can run, so it can actually release some of that energy. The gazelle runs, doesn't get away fast enough, it dies, the story's over. If the gazelle gets away, however, it usually will join its herd, so it has that great group, 
And then it doesn't sit there and say, why did the lion pick me? Why did, it, why did, why did he not chase somebody else? When's he going to do it again? What happened? And yet that's what we end up doing as human beings. And so we relive it, and we plan, and we pre-plan, so the next time it won't be me, it'll be my, my buddy right here or something. And so, so the, poor, the poor gazelle, if that was us, is just setting itself up for the next attack, right? Because he's not focused on the moment, he's not present, he's not paying attention. No wonder the next lion comes and attacks him. And so I find when I often when I talk to patients about lions and gazelles, um, they, they start to understand what's happening in their own bodies. And, and where we start talking about the stress and the, the uh, impact of the, on the adrenals is that we, we have that, that, that um, uh, sympathetic nervous system response. It's very short term, right? The adrenaline is short term. It's very good. It's great for immediate causes. It's for a situation that's going to resolve itself. Cortisol kicks in very quickly because it says, oh, this might go on for a little bit longer than I expected. And cortisol is a wonderful hormone. You know, we all know it rises, it's higher in the morning, it decreases as the day goes on. But it also spikes whenever there's an, an, a need for extra energy. And so cortisol sends our blood pressure up higher, it sends our blood sugar up higher, because if you're going to be running from that gazelle for a while, or sorry, if you're going to be running from that lion for a while, you're going to need to have blood, you're going to need to have energy. Um, it also decreases... Um, um, your, your body's immune response because, again, who cares about survival in the long term if you're just trying to respond, um, if you're just trying to survive. Again, it, it affects your GI system, it affects whether you're affecting, um, absorbing your nutrients, affects elimination, and we start seeing how this elevated stress response actually has some profound physiologic effects, most of which you can see in your family's office, in your practice. Uh, one of the things that sometimes misleads us, I'm, I'll, and I'll get back to that story in, in a minute, um, are the minor hormones. So in my practice, I see a lot of people, um, I, I, I often say that I work with perimenopausal and menopausal women in stress, and then I see their mothers, and then I see their daughters, and then I see their husbands, and then I see their book club. And uh, so it's, a, it's kind of a, a lovely way to have a practice, um, because while well, initially the perimenopausal and menopausal women are the ones who are often in the greatest distress, and they're also the ones who are most proactive about seeking help. But usually they live in families where they can identify often their spouses um, uh, who are suffering from similar symptoms, and they realize that there's a place where they can, they can get benefit too. But a lot of the symptoms that often send uh, women in for help have to do with symptoms of menopause and perimenopause, and often estrogen and progesterone um, seeming uh, depletions. One of the things that I've seen in my practice that's been quite amazing, particularly in the population that's in their lower 40s, is that um, it, uh, like often I'll see women coming in and they're having some hot flashes and missed, missed menses and they're more irritable and they're yelling at the kids and, you know, and their husband doesn't know what's wrong with them anymore. And, um, and this whole big story. A lot of times I find that if I just focus on the adrenal support piece, on helping them um, take care of their, their lifestyle issues and their nutritional issues and, and to adding in a few supplements, then we don't, the hormones just normalize, especially at that age. And, so, and then they, they don't come back for another five or 10 years um, when they actually maybe are in, in uh, true menopause. Um, so the impact is recognizing how everything here is, is connected. Uh, so this is a uh, uh, chart of um, how hormones are made in your body. Um, it's not the one I usually use, but um, one of the things I always draw people's attention to is that all your sex hormones and your, your adrenal hormones need cholesterol. And so in my fat phobic population, um, we have a lot, long discussion about good fats versus bad, bad fats, talking about olive oil and walnuts and avocados and, and omega-3 fatty acids and your fatty fish. Um, and about recognizing that all fat is not bad fat. Um, so you need adequate amounts of cholesterol. Cholesterol comes down and makes pregnenolone. And pregnenolone breaks into two, from pregnenolone, there's two branches. One is here progesterone, um, and the other one is uh, DHEA. And from DHEA, uh, which is also a hormone that's made in the adrenal glands in response to stress that we'll be speaking to shortly, um, DHEA breaks down to make androstenedione, testosterone, estradiol, estrone, estriol. There's a little bit of a crossover. Usually I, this is a dotted line on the chart I use at home, but I didn't know how to put it on a slide. Um, progesterone uh, goes quite directly down to help to make cortisol, and this will be, be important later on. 
aldosterone is also implicated too. So, you know, it, it helps explain why our anorexic patients don't have very good hormonal function. Um, you know, there's not enough fat, there's not enough, you can't make hormones, let alone all the other things that need to happen. Um, so, so when I talk about um, the stress, and I, and I sort of talk about adrenal fatigue, um, in medical school we're taught, I mean I was taught two main things about the adrenals, or yeah, maybe you guys remembered a lot more, but what I learned about adrenal function is you can have too much, which is called Cushing's disease, or you can have too little, which was called Addison's disease. And that basically, as long as you didn't have any one or the other, then you, you weren't diseased. Um, and there wasn't, nobody ever talked about the fact that, well, what happens between Cushing's and uh, Addison's? Like, is that all normal, or is there a spectrum of normal? And so the functional medicine approach, and the approach that I've used even before I knew about functional medicine, is recognizing that most of most of life is experienced on a spectrum. You're not either diseased or not diseased. It's not like one day you woke up and you had diabetes, unless you had you know, type one. Um, usually it took 10, 20, 30 years in order for you to develop diabetes. And uh, I, I don't find that we're very well trained in this model of spectrum of disease. Um, to understand adrenal fatigue or to understand uh, hypothalamic pituitary axis dysfunction, to understand any of that is we really have to look at that, that spectrum. So if we consider that in the midline is absolute normal and at one end is Addison's and one end is, is Cushing's, and um, as we go through the sort of physiology of what happens with cortisol, we can see how patients can actually become a little bit cushing -oid when initially when there's too much cortisol being put, put out, you know, there's stress, so they're, they're going long-term stress is going to make them a little bit more cushing -oid. I'll explain why in a minute. And then really, really long-term stress or sudden acute stress on top of that, that prolonged one can actually put them down towards the Addison's picture. And so some of the, the complaints that have been launched against um, uh, the adrenal fatigue picture is that, well, some people talk about it as being too much cortisol, and some people talk about it as being too, much, uh, too little cortisol. And it gets very confusing because the picture is up and down. And so I try to leave the, the labeling part of it out and come back to this idea of, as, a, as an HPA axis dysfunction. But the reality is, because we're looking at all those factors that are involved in stress, you can't really call it an HPA axis anymore. Um, it's your psychoneuroimmunogastroendocrine system that's at play. This is a, one from one of the uh, Institute of Functional Medicine conferences. And I won't go through all of it because it's actually not very complete. I, I, I printed it off thinking, oh, this is great. It covers everything. And it, and it hardly covers any of it. But some of the, um, just the important things that are worthwhile are, um, you know, the hypothalamus, releases uh, corticotropin releasing hormone which goes to the pituitary anterior pituitary produces ACTH um, which then goes to sort of the adrenals goes to the adrenal cortex and the adrenal cortex then produces the cortisol and the cortisol has a feedback mechanism that goes back up to the hypothalamus so presumably if you're making way too much cortisol the hypothalamus will go up and eventually say hey don't make so much and that's how we normally regulate um, what often is forgotten is that the, that the cortisol also has an effect on the thymus. It actually also has an effect on the gonads. It has an effect on the T cells. It has an effect on the pineal gland. It has an effect on our gastrointestinal system. It, it basically affects everything. Every cell in your body has a cortisol receptor. And so whether the cortisol level is up or down, your body's going to recognize that. And, uh, and, and it explains why everything changes when you get overly stressed. So really, that, that it's the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal thyroid gonadal gastrointestinal axis. But I'll just keep calling it the HPA axis for short. Um, one of the beauties that I found is as I've, as I've looked at the, the, all the connections of where cortisol comes in, is that all of a sudden, all these things that didn't make sense make a huge difference. So if I'm treating somebody with thyroid disease or um, with thyroid, um, who's hypothyroid, let's keep it that way. Um, a lot of times, I, I'm, I'm sure there's more than one person here who has people who don't respond very well to their thyroid treatments. And uh, so what I find is that if I start modulating the things that actually affect their cortisol levels or would affect their stress, I actually get much better results on, for their thyroid disease. And the same too with their hormones. If I'm just treating somebody for their hormones um, and, I'm not, and I'm ignoring the, the cortisol piece, their, their symptoms don't improve as well. Um, when you have an excess of, of cortisol, cortisol is involved in, it, it, it 
excess of cortisol blocks the conversion of T3 of T4 to T3. So you, it's just harder to, to convert it over. So you often get an excess of T4, but T3 is actually the active part of the, of the thyroid, and that actually has, has the metabolic effects in the body. So if it's being blocked, it can't be helped. A very large proportion of, our, um, of the, that conversion actually takes place in the gut. If you're so stressed that you're not able to digest your food properly, or you're so stressed that you're drink, living on caffeine and alcohol and sugar, that's going to affect the environment of your gut. Again, you're not going to absorb your, not being able to convert your T3 to T4 properly. If your liver is all bunged up because you've been drinking all that alcohol and caffeine and sugar and you've got a fatty liver, well, you're also not going to convert T4 to T3 properly. And so what I'm finding and, and is that the more I look, the deeper I look, everything is connected. Um, so the hormones are just one piece of the puzzle and working with the cortisol, but it's a really big one because it, it touches almost everything. So uh, this is that um, hand cell use, so the adaptation response. So we sp I spoke about this earlier. The, the, the um, uh, sympathetic nervous system um, where everything gets aroused and it's based on survival. So the adaptation response is um, the HPA axis, you get the increased cortisol and increased DHEA. So the cortisol it helps to maintain the blood sugar, helps keep the blood pressure, and helps keep you running. So in our animal model, what we were supposed to do is if we're animals, we might be needing to run for another, you know, um, day, maybe a day and a half. And by then, either the, the lion would have given up or else we'd be eaten and, uh, and the game would be over. And again, if, if we had evaded the lion, then we'd go back, we'd find our herd, we'd settle down, we'd relax, and we'd be like the zebras who don't get ulcers in Robert Sapolsky's book. However, what happens in our life is that those tigers and lions just keep jumping out. So you have the caffeine, you have the, the car ride, the argument, the discussion, the stress, the work late, all this, and it keeps adding up. And so whereas we're just supposed to have you know, one big run away from the lion once a day, all of a sudden we have lions and tigers jumping at us all day long. And so the, um, uh, the what am I talking about? Here, the um, so your adrenaline's going up and the cortisol just takes over. And the cortisol remains elevated almost all day long. And I can, and we'll, I'll show you on some of the um, uh, salivary hormone testing slides that I do. So you see it elevated all day long because they're always being stimulated, always being in it stimulated, and then also again at night. And so what we start seeing is that these changes in the body have to do with, with an elevated cortisol, cortisol level. So elevated cortisol, it sends a message to the, to the liver to produce more, more sugar. So you get more gluconeogenesis. Um, you get increased muscle and protein, sorry, protein muscle breakdown. You get demineralization of the bone. Uh, uh, we start having altered immunity, having high blood pressure, having insulin resistance. And slowly, because the, that cortisol is constantly staying up, it's causing some problems in patients um, and their health. So the long-term response, it might be resilience and that the body finds a new normal. Oh, okay, well, I'll just settle in with these few extra pounds or with this high blood pressure or I'll make these small changes in my life so that I'm actually fine and I'm not noticing how, how uh, the impact of this. Or some people actually just are able to adapt and adapt and adapt and adapt and are able to stay very, very stable despite the stressors. They're always constantly able to adapt. The problem is when the body becomes maladaptive and it begins to produce less cortisol. And you have to have the symptoms of adrenal insufficiency or adrenal fatigue. And so it's kind of like, um, like I would say adrenal fatigue is more like a subclinical, secondary, or even a tertiary um, adrenal insufficiency. Um, it's, you know, you, it's really hard when you start looking at the literature and trying to find out what there is um, uh, at the looking at adrenal fatigue. I, I, had a, I did a literature search for adrenal fatigue I would actually had the college um, library do one for me, and uh, they couldn't find one single article in medical literature under adrenal fatigue, uh, which was interesting. But we found lots under adrenal insufficiency. Uh, that was really applicable, and also a lot of um, information about uh, cortisol testing, um, particularly with salivary testing. So, so there's one other part of the adaptation response, and I call it resistance, and this is often helps with resilience, but it's not resilience. This was me preparing for this presentation. And uh, it's quite different from resilience. And so th the biggest thing around the resistance is that even though it may look like the person is coping, 
they're actually creating more and more stress in their bodies. Whereas with the resilience, what I, I've had this poster in my office for a number of years, and it's really actually having the person move towards inward, inwards into their inner self and into their inner state of being and being able to keep nurturing themselves in whatever way that, that matters, despite the storms that are going around. Most people keep searching outwards and, and, and uh, fail to return to their inner center. One of the impacts of this, this is, uh, again, not a, a great slide, and I apologize for that, um, is this. So, so this is the steroidal principle pathways, the chronic stress response, or you get pregnenolone steel. So again, here we have the cholesterol, um, which is being made, which is helped to be made by your B5 and, and uh, by other your dietary fats. And uh, normally it makes pregnenolone, and then it makes progesterone. What happens with that chronic stress picture is that if the cortisol is being perceived as being depleted, then it kind of moves up this pathway here. And uh, I often find that um, people have a lot more symptoms of inadequate progesterone, of low progesterone, when they're exhausted. And uh, sometimes people will start, again, it's all those, a lot of those perimenopausal symptoms. So a lot of times we jump in here and we give them some progesterone if we think of it. Um, but it, it doesn't necessarily work if this is actually where the problem is. Um, it can go all the way back up to pregnanolone. And again, pregnanolone helps to make DHEA. Um, and DHA is also um, made in the uh, adrenal glands. And so both the DHEA and the cortisol can end up becoming depleted with chronic stress. And when that happens, you get decompensation. So adrenal hyper and hypofunction signs and symptoms can overlap. And so this is where, you know, people, I mean, adrenal fatigue gets mocked. Well, is it this or is it that? Well, which one is it? And again, I come back to the fact, think of it as HPA axis dysfunction. Uh, normally, the cortisol rises in the morning and then it decreases over the course of the day. Initially, when we're compensating for something, the cortisol levels are high. And during that time, a lot of people will feel energized. I can do anything. You know, well, yeah, I'm not sleeping well, I'm not eating well, but look at how much I can do. And then slowly what starts to happen is that their ability to function starts slowly decreasing, decreasing, decreasing. But at both places, you can, have, you can be unable to sleep because your cortisol levels are too high, you can be unable to sleep because your cortisol levels are too low. So one of the things that I do that's um, controversial, I, somewhat, um, is I do some salivary hormone testing with my patients. Uh, um, I, um, what I found is that it's a really great test for showing people where their salivary cortisol, where their cortisol levels are, and helping them understand what it is that I'm talking about. And so it's a great feedback tool for it. There are tests, and, and I'll, I'll look at them a little bit later. You can do a, a serum cortisol test, uh, which isn't a very useful test of anything because most of the cortisol in your body is, is bound, and so there's only about 4% of it's that free. Uh, free serum cortisol levels are, are very expensive, and um, uh, they don't give you that much more information. Um, and uh, so I find, and, and you can also do a urinary, 24-hour urinary test, which can be helpful if, you're, if the results are really high or if the results are really low. Um, but they also don't give you an idea of the pattern that the patient is dealing with. And this is how I would interpret it. This doesn't necessarily mean that you as a family doctor need to start doing salivary cortisols on your patients, but I think what we're gonna see is over the next five to 10 years, we're gonna see particularly for cortisol that um, this is uh, becoming a much more common test. There's a number of labs um, in, uh, in, like throughout the United States particularly. I, I do my testing out of Burnaby, um, but uh, I know BGH actually has a cortisol lab as well. Um, the, uh, the, the, um, the person who runs the lab that I work with, whenever he gets abnormal results that he can't ver verify or he feels that they're out of, out of whack, he'll take the salivary sample and send it to VGH to have it tested against their, their lab and see how that works. So I'm not sure why it's not used more, um, and that's something that I need to investigate as well. So if you look here at, um, this is a 42-year-old physician, actually, who came to see me, um, who was very anxious. Um, and really, really high morning cortisol, sort of lower end noon, evening cortisols, and then rising up at night. And her biggest issue was that she couldn't sleep. Um, she was anxious, she had, four, she had two children, uh, a new house, a husband who was in a sort of high-risk career, 
and um, not an um, abnormal situation, um, but she, she couldn't sleep and she couldn't sleep and had tried going on Zopiclone and, and then had found that that actually made things worse because as soon as she stopped taking it, things were, she couldn't, she couldn't sleep at all. Um, so in this particular situation, the DHEA is elevated. So often what happens, well, what usually happens with, a, with a, an acute stress response is that the cortisol level rises and so does the DHEA. Um, and uh, so she's basically young. She, she's young, she's healthy. There's a whole lot um, happening for her, but she's got this really abnormal pattern here. Uh, here's another one that's somewhat similar. This is a 47-year-old woman. And what you see here is an, uh, still an elevated, um, but within normal range, morning cortisol, a big sort of lower dip through the day and then a big rise. Had a similar situation, except that she'd been suffering for quite a bit longer period of time. She'd been getting more and more tired over the last, um, over the last few years. Uh, and at the age of 47, I'm sorry, DHEA being that low, it sort of implied that she was somewhat chronically stressed or chronically fatigued. One of the things that people sometimes mistake is they think that the cortisol, how do I put it, that the, that the low cortisol is a cause of their symptoms. Like, oh, well, the reason why I'm unwell is because my cortisol is low. I have a problem with my cortisol. And maybe that's one of the biggest um, misconceptions that the whole adrenal fatigue book sort of seems to imply. It doesn't actually say that, but I can see how people understand that. I always explain to them that this is a, it's a reactive. This is your body responding to what you are doing to it or what you're asking of it or what you're perceiving. So this is the way your body's responding. Um, an interesting study that was done that looked at, noticed that stressed women of this particular population seem to all have low cortisols. And when they actually, um, but then they thought, well, do they actually have low cortisols or um, because of the stress, or do they actually have naturally low cortisols? So they re repeated the test uh, uh, a year later. And some of the implication was, was that these are women who probably had somewhat low functioning cortisol to begin with because even here a year later, um, their cortisol levels were still low. Now, the problem with this study is you don't know what they actually did in that year beforehand. Like, did the stress, was the stress response, or the stressful issue, was it re relieved? Did they change jobs? Did they do anything? That, none of that's discussed in the study. But um, I would say that there's a large base for, for variability in that some people do have lower baseline um, levels of cortisol than other people have higher. Um, and yet, I find that with, the, with practice, interpreting through this makes a big difference. Uh, this next woman was very interesting. Um, so this is sort of an example of somebody whose cortisol levels overall are quite low. So her, her again, the normal loop curve would go through the, through the boxes. Somebody who's kind of over adrenaline or over cortisolized would go up like that, and then these slowly come down. Often I find that they come home, come down first in the evenings, and then the last one to come down is during the day. Now she has a relatively normal DHEA on salivary testing. Um, this is a, a woman, she was uh, in her 40s as well, uh, a massage therapist. And she came to see me because she'd had 26 surgeries on her tooth, on one of her teeth, uh, and the sinus that's associated with it. And uh, what the problem had been is that every time she had surgery, she had so much pain and dysfunction was that she was unable to work for two months at a time. And the medications didn't work, and she was frustrated, and she was self-employed. So it meant that for two months of the year, every time she had one of these surgeries, she was unable to function. And so on the basis of her history, but also looking at this study, one of the things that we decided to do was um, uh, I put her on some oral hydrocortisone just before her surgery. Uh, so a very low dose of 10 milligrams in the morning, and I think, uh, I don't even think it was, it might have been five milligrams at, at lunchtime. Um, so she did that for about a week before her surgery, and then she did it for about a week after. And she, she came back absolutely delighted because she would find that all she needed to do was to take her cortisone and she could take one morphine and she was completely functional. And she was back at work within a week of after her surgery. And this would have been her 27th surgery and she was still functioning really well. So it's, um, it, it's and, and then she didn't stay on oral hydrocortisone long term, but we use it for the short term interventions for sort of an acute on chronic stress situation. So low morning cortisol with, with low DHEA. This is a 64-year-old gentleman who, in his early 50s, had had a, a myocardial infarction and required a CABG, and, and had gone on to um, um, had gone on to di on disability at that time, and had been exhausted and tired ever since. And he'd been he was already put on testosterone and a number of cardiac medications, but just couldn't get any better. 
And so I, we just did very mild, minor interventions. You can see his uh, DHEA, oops, sorry, um, his DHEA here, now do that again. Uh, DHEA here is like right in his boots. So um, that's really way low, and while these are low, um, I didn't put him on hydrocortisone, I just supported him with some other, other nutritional things we'll talk about, and uh, he's done really, really well. Um, now his wife is upset because he has more energy than she does. So again, adrenal hyperfunction, if we're gonna look at symptoms, you get the midline weight gain and you can't lose it, which has a lot to do with insulin resistance. Often tired but wired, insomnia, depressed, anxious, irritable, hypertension, menopausal symptoms, thyroid dysfunction, sugar cravings, and the GI symptoms. Adrenal hypofunction, and so this is your classic adrenal fatigue picture, was the fatigue and the lassitude. And again, nervousness, irritability, depression, a lot more fainting and spells, uh, apprehension, excessive weakness. Uh, one of the, the key things that alerts me to the fact that people are stressed beyond their maximal capacity is when I see uh, people coming in, male or female, who probably formerly had felt a real sense of um, assertiveness in their lives and they no longer feel that they're, they're overwhelmed. You know, somebody who's asked to do one more thing, can you just do the laundry? And they scream at their partner because it was just one thing that was too much more to do. Um, often small things. And uh, people often come in to me sort of just saying, I, I don't know who I am anymore. Um, I used to be able to do all these things, and now I can't. And, uh, and so we start looking at w what else is there. But that overwhelmed feeling is really big. Um, often recurrent infections, frequent injuries, caffeine stimulant addiction or intolerance. Um, those are all things that classically uh, Dr. Wilson talks about in his book. Um, they're all symptoms of sort of low or, or, or subclinical adrenal insufficiency or even adrenal insufficiency. Um, I just notice them, and I notice the patterns recurring and recurring and recurring. And um, I use them as cues. I don't, so for me, rather than investigating them first of all, um, I start looking at the, at the baseline, what's happening with the adrenals. And one of the biggest complaints is that these people often suffer. You know, where everybody else would be fine, they're suffering and suffering. And uh, I don't know if they're yawning, but I thought they looked like they were suffering. Um, so a couple notes on DHEA. It primarily originates in the adrenal gland, and it's also stimulated by ACTH. So as it rises and falls uh, with the cortisol, um, it, it has a similar signal for it. In males, it peaks around age 20, and in females, range around age 30. And uh, it's thought to be one of the big things in female uh, libido as well, because for a male, if you take off his testes, you know, his libido is going to drop. For a woman, you can remove her ovaries and her uterus, and she will, can still have a really good libido. And I often trace it back to sort of the ancient survival. If you were so stressed and exhausted, you know, in the olden times, often it was because there was a famine would be your main reason why you'd be stressed. You're not going to want to have a libido because the last thing you want to have is a child when you can barely survive yourself. Um, its decline is more rapid if there's chronic stress, disease, and, uh, and with anything of aging. Um, I find that people who've been on long-term high-dose corticosteroids often have very low DHEA. And uh, I have some of the patients I've had in my practice, I didn't know quite, you know, whether this would work or not. They came in, again, they're on steroids for um, uh, sort of rheumatoid arthritis is the woman I'm thinking of in particular. And, uh, you know, low D DHEA and, again, some of the other um, things we're going to talk about. And uh, um, significant increase in energy just by adding that in. Um, DHEA not only has significant effects on itself, but it also converts into more potent hormones, the male and the female. Um, insulin, which is in big bold letters, but I'm not gonna talk about it as much as I'd like to. I, I think one of the biggest things that I needed to learn around insulin is that um, when we eat food, uh, high glycemic foods, blood sugar shoots up, insulin shoots up, blood sugar drops. When the blood sugar drops, it is actually triggers a stress response in the body. And, and so low blood sugar is often tr triggers a cortisol release. Cortisol gets released. Cortisol stimulates the rise of blood sugar. Blood sugar goes up, insulin goes up, and it helps to keep that, that cycle going. So I've become a lot more cautious around looking at uh, insulin resistance in my, in my patients who are tired. So testing, I talked a little bit about the cortisol. Um, uh, so blood cortisol levels, it's, I, I do them every once in a while just to make sure they're in the normal range. Um, what I find is that they're in the normal range. It doesn't tell me that the patient doesn't have some dysfunction or some subclinical dysfunction. And that's where I find that the cortisol testing works really well. Again, 24-hour urinary free cortisol is a really good test. 
if, to see if there's too much or too little cortisol, it's really good. Um, if it falls in the middle, it doesn't still give you the pattern. Uh, so that's my own personal preference for that. I'll go back. So management. The management really has to do um, is a lot around lifestyle. Um, I could use two massages a week. I think we should all be prescribed something like that. And the bottom line of it is nutrition. Um, a lot of these slides that I hear that have all the, the references, um, they're taken from one of the functional medicine slides, our, our presentations, um, just because I thought that the references would be really useful for you. I, probably, I don't have enough time to read through all of them. Um, but I think what's really important is that the stress-dominated system shuts down the appropriate functions of digestion. And it decreases how well we absorb our food. And because we're not absorbing our food, often we have uh, food that's irritating our guts, that's left inside. A very large proportion of our immune system, about 70% of our immune system, is actually within the lining of the gut, just within, below that first layer of cells. And, uh, and that has a huge impact upon the rest of the body. Um, so basically, a whole foods, plant-based, uh, high protein, not high protein, but, but adequate protein diet um, makes a big difference um, uh, for most of the patients. And what I find is that a lot of people, I had somebody in the other day who told me exhausted patients. So that's, that's the, that's, I'm not talking about everybody in the world needs to eat like this, but for your exhausted patients, you know, she was eating a really good breakfast of Special K or maybe it was bran flakes with milk and strawberries. And what she didn't realize is that basically that was carbohydrate, carbohydrate, carbohydrate. And, and by the time you get into a cereal that's so processed, it's a fairly simple carbohydrate and quite easily absorbed. So she was starting off her day with a big sugar spike. I find that if you do nothing else other than to take get your, your tired patients and to um, have them have protein in the morning, it doesn't need to mean they have eggs every morning, but you can have you know, nut butters or have, you know, muesli with nuts and seeds in it or have a protein shake or, um, you know, the variations, especially living in Vancouver, are, are insane. Um, but I find good protein and good fats as well. And so a lot of patient education around the differences between good fats and bad fats and recognizing that you can actually take in a fair bit of olive oil and cod liver oil and nuts and seeds um, and still do really well and increasing the vegetables and fiber. The, the really important parts are what you decrease. Um, I find that people who's, um, a, sort of their, who have HPA axis dysfunction are just really sensitive to sugar. And uh, there was a doctor, um, Dr. Tintera, in I think the 1940s who first started looking at this. And that was one of his things, was he noticed people were sensitive to sugar. I have people who do well just by taking out the sugar. Their energy revives, everything, sort of everything balances itself out. Um, caffeine, alcohol, processed foods, foods to which sensitivities exist, which is often wheat and dairy, and uh, a caution to, with gluten for those with thyroid and, and other problems um, and other autoimmune disorders. If I can get everybody that I see to just do this, and I, I can't, but if I can, um, then I would hopefully not be working at all. Um, often if people complain of low blood pressure and lightheadedness, um, I, I encourage them to eat salt. Um, add more salt. I think many of us do that for our low blood pressure patients and it makes a really big difference, often in the morning. Um, exercise. Uh, so a little bit different again. So the, for the people who have the adrenal hyperfunction and are really, really stressed, sometimes it's um, a really um, sort of adrenalized. I, I allow them a lot more vigorous activity and I allow them to sort of burn off whatever they can, whatever frustrations, because that's what you would be doing if you were that gazelle on the savanna. Right? If you were had cortisol pumping that high, you would be running like stink. So I encourage them to use that. But to really balance it out. The people that I really worry about are my exhausted patients who still want to exercise two hours a day. And I have to argue with them quite a bit to get them to just walk. Keep your heart rate low. Allow yourself not to move into a place of overexertion. And uh, it's, it's really hard because that's how a lot of them um, uh, get their, actually ha that's how they function with their stress. So we try to use some, some weights or else I put them on a, a pattern of, um, of sort of interval training at a, at a lower intensity. Um, I like this, but I don't have time for it. It's a stress reduction kit and you bang head here. Um, that can work quite well as well. Um, a, a good study on yoga. Um, I, uh, I find yoga is, is very popular these days and it's very easy to get people to go to a yoga class. 
Do not send them to Bikram's yoga. They do not need hot yoga, whether they're stressed or they're not. Most of them are already hyper-functioning, and everybody loves Bikram's yoga because it's hot, and they feel good, and they feel like they've been in a sauna. They all get exhausted, and they get more and more. I've had really healthy people get super exhausted from doing Bikrams. So I generally send them for like a yin, ya, yin yoga or restorative yoga or something that's really gentle and slow. Um, the basic supplemental approach, good quality multivitamin. If you go and you start doing some research on B vitamins today, there is a phenomenal amount of excellent research on it um, and on the benefits of, of your different Bs and your B complex. Um, and uh, partly because the, the bees are involved in almost every, every process of, of um, energy metabolism in the body. You'll find it in your citric acid cycle ring, your, your pyruvate ring, and your, um, you'll find it in production of your neurotransmitters. Everywhere you look, you're going to need particularly B5 and B6, but also often B1, your thiamine. Uh, sorry, your, yeah, your thiamine. Um, so I get everybody on a B complex. Um, I tell them, please don't go and buy Kirkland at, and don't buy Life Brand and don't buy, you don't have to buy the most expensive brand on earth, but try to get something that's not a hard little tablet that's been, that's the cheapest thing you can buy. Um, I have some brands that I use, um, but I, I don't sell them in my office or anything. Um, B5, particularly pantothenic acid, um, can be used in quite high doses. I don't often use them at 1,500 milligrams. I usually keep them close to the 500 range, um, sometimes up to 1,000. B6, pyridoxine. Um, about, uh, you can take it up to 200 milligrams a day, sometimes 300 milligrams. Biotin, which is also known as B7, makes a difference in folic acid. Uh, vitamin C, magnesium, and the omega-3 fatty acids. So what I have here um, that follows, and I'm hoping you guys will take a chance and take a look at it because I'm definitely going to be out of time. Um, the, there's some, some good references on the use of B vitamins and the effects of high-dose B complex. Um, this one is uh, had to do with mood and perceived stress, which is stress is all about perceived stress. Pantothenic acid, vitamin C and adrenal function, uh, consequences of magnesium deficiency. Uh, magnesium is one thing that I, I use a lot of. I had a uh, physician um, come to see me once, and we did all the tests for her. And at the end, at the end of her, I gave her my little list of recommendations. And she said, you know, I don't take any pills. I don't take anything. If there's one thing that I can do, what should I take? And so she was about a 56-year-old physician in really good health, but her biggest complaint was around just generalized achiness. And she was off on a canoe trip shortly and was worried that she was going to get achier. And so the single thing that, that we did was we settled on a um, magnesium supplement at that time. And I generally use magnesium bisglycinate because it's better absorbed and better tolerated than most of the others. And she wrote me back two weeks later to say that she was very happy and that she was just going to take the magnesium, and that's worked well. Omega-3 fatty acids, I think by now, you know, they're implicated everywhere, whether it's cardiovascular disease or, or emotional uh, issues or um, vision, skin, elimination. Um, phosphatidylserine is worth mentioning. Uh, phosphatidylserine is actually, uh, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's in the phospholipid, a layer of, of each cell. And what it, I don't exactly understand why it works with the cortisol. Um, I, I, I've been looking and trying to find exactly what the mechanism is for. But it works really, really well in patients who can't sleep at night who have, uh, because their cortisol levels are running high, um, who have that sort of tired but wired and are generally healthy kind of a, appeal. And so I find, I don't usually 600 to 800, I find a lot of my patients do well at 300 to 400, and we just increase it by 100s, um, and it makes a big difference. Great sleeping pill, and, uh, and it doesn't make them calm them down, it just helps them to sleep. Uh, sleep is huge. Um, cor cortisol and melatonin are inversely correlated. So your cortisol is high at night and comes down in the morning. Melatonin is high at night and comes down during the day. So if your cortisol level is high at night, then adding in some melatonin orally can help to push the cortisol levels down a little bit. Uh, one of the conferences I went to was quite interesting because w what he basically said was that physiologically we only need very tiny amounts of melatonin. And so if you're going to use melatonin as a supplement, I often start at 0.5 milligrams or 1 milligram and use them very, very low. A lot of times it's hard to find anything that low. But physiologically, our bodies respond better to it at a low dose than a high dose, um, whereas a lot of people are very happily popping 5 milligrams and 10 milligrams. Um, they have other effects, um, positive effects. Melatonin is a good um, uh, antioxidant. 5-HTP is also great. 5-HTP uh, is a precursor to tryptophan, which is a precursor to serotonin. 
Um, and again, for your patients who are terrified of medications and pills, 5-HTP is a very well studied, very well documented um, sleeping pill. The other thing I use a lot in my, my perimenopausal patients is uh, just Prometrium, um, 100 milligrams or 200 milligrams at night. Uh, has a huge impact when we think about that pregnenolone steel picture. Um, and I do use some adaptogenic herbs. Um, and we'll go over those and we can have a long discussion at some point. Rhodiola, rosea is a, is a good one. Um, and there's more information on it. Ashwagandha, ashwagandha is an old, uh, it's been used in the um, Ayurvedic medicine for a very long period of time, I'm like, I don't know, 4,000 years or something. Um, and as uh, it, it works, um, it works quite well. You can use any of these singly or together. Eleutherococcus centicosis is another one that's really well often used in Panax ginseng. And I often have a few formulations that I have my patients take of them, but some people will just use, do well with just a single one, just to tell them, you know, take some rhodiola, um, rhodiola and see how you do, um, and that works well. What I like about these is that they're safe and they're very, very well tolerated. Um, glycerism, basically the, from licorice, is, uh, is also great, but better for people who have low blood pressure. So anybody who's got high blood pressure, borderline pressure, I, I don't use licorice with, um, uh, even if they have all the other symptoms. It's, it's very good for uh, cortisol balancing. Um, replacing with DHEA, there's information here on, um, on how, to, how to replace it, using it for both men and women. And uh, basically, I get the baseline DHEAS. I, I do use the blood work a fair bit in, in the work that I do. Um, and start with a low dose DHEA of 10 milligrams and up to 25 milligrams. And this will vary very much from person to person, whether they're male or female, whether they're sensitive to things. Um, D, the interesting thing around DHEA is that it usually takes three to six months to have an effect. So I get people to move to start, sometimes I start them higher if they, can, if they seem very keen, and then we cut down the dose, sometimes they go up. Okay, I'm just getting the cue that I'm out of time. I'm, uh, so I will, uh, there's a slide on oral hydrocortisone, I'm just gonna make sure. And what I did wanna finish with um, has to do with lifestyle recommendations and doing sort of a lot of listening to your patients. But basically, what you are in love with, what seizes your imagination will affect everything. It will decide what gets you out of bed in the mornings what you do with your evenings, how you spend your weekends, what you read, who you know, what breaks your heart, and what amazes you. Fall in love, stay in love, and it will decide everything. And it's advice that I try to convey to my patients um, and ask them to do what they love as part of their treatment plan. Thank you very much.